Hi everyone, it's Swank Ivy again with another Letters to an Asexual. This is number 119. Today I'm going to be talking about another angle on LGBTQ plus and asexual inclusion. And one of the things that I seem to see a lot in reviews for my book now that it's been about a decade since it came out is that people object to how I covered inclusion for asexual people in LGBTQ plus communities. And even though at that time, I thought I was pretty clear that I consider asexual people to be queer on the basis of being ace, if that's the label that they want to embrace. And I personally used the term queer for myself and did at that time. And there wasn't any place in the book where I said asexual people cannot be considered queer on the basis of their asexuality. There are people who somehow took that message away from what I wrote because I also cautioned them to be very careful about the groups that they approached because especially at the time that I wrote this book, it was a lot less common for asexual people to be automatically included in these broader groups. And it wasn't a given that asexual people would be in that plus that you often see after the queue. And I've said this before, but I do worry sometimes about people being misunderstood and misinterpreted and going into places that they think they're safe when they aren't. And back when I wrote the book, that was a little more likely because you did see some hostility, you did see some in-group fighting about whether asexual people deserved to be there. And you still see that sort of thing, but you also see it with trans people, you also see it with bisexual people. You see people wanting to be exclusionary because they feel that their own legitimacy depends on excluding others or that their spaces are only for people who have their specific stripe of problems. <laughs> so I'd like to share a conversation that I weighed in on that happened I believe in 2014, so it's a good 10 years ago. And it started with an anonymous person sending a message to another Tumblr blog. And I'm going to go ahead and read you what they said. Anonymous asked, I've not heard of someone being disowned for being ace, but they do get shit for it. They're often asked if they were assaulted, even when the person has no place to ask, told that they're a prude and stuck up. Some people say they're wrong in the head and need to go to the doctor among other similar gross things, people will feel broken and lost for being ace, and even feel horribly guilty and like a monster at times. Plus, sex is held at such a high place and seen as true happiness for some, and in society, including parents of ace people. Plus, their issues are often ignored by the LGBT groups, and they're scorned and shunned. So while I personally haven't heard of someone being kicked out for being ace, they do have problems. Either way, I'm glad the person's situation ended well. And the person who received this comment replied with this. I understand that ace people get shit for it. Corrective rape or threats of corrective rape happen, which is horrific on every level. And people say nasty shit about ace people and imply that they're broken. It's wrong and it's hurtful and that absolutely needs to change. I get that. I really do. I would never deny that ace slash aero people have issues. That said, people who are dual ace aero or people who are ace slash hetero romantic do not have a right to be in LGBTQ plus spaces unless they are explicitly welcomed. Those spaces are for people who are systematically oppressed denied the right to marry their partner, people whose genders aren't even recognized by society, people who are beaten to death, denied jobs or housing, or totally ostracized by their peers. If a queer couple walk down the street expressing their affection towards one another, there's every chance of slurs being slung at them or worse. If an ace aero person walks down the street simply being ace aero, their well-being is not in danger. That is the difference. Obviously, this doesn't apply to people who are ace and bi slash pan slash homo etc. romantic, or people who are aero and bi slash pan slash homo etc. sexual. And someone else reblogged that on Tumblr and wrote, And now I'm curious, any of my followers who are willing to raise their hands, how many of you who are aero and on the ace spectrum also have or have had a same gender partner? 
So this is where I came in and I said this. I've said this before and I'll say it again. While I believe every queer space needs to be the final authority on who it wants to extend its welcome to, I think it's a mistake to define the experience of queerness entirely as being hated. If homophobia and transphobia disappeared tomorrow, wouldn't queerness still have a meaning? Do we depend on other people's hate for identity? Does violence and ostracizing and disgust and institutionalized oppression have to cross a certain line of terrible before everyone can nod and agree that a person might benefit from fellowship in a group uniquely qualified to understand being other? Or will we continue to assume that the way asexual people are hated has to look enough like how LGBT people are hated before they agree they're both hurt in different ways to different degrees by the same heteronormative root? It's also weird to me that WTF, asexuals, gay people are actually hurt. Trans people are actually hurt. You are not! Comes up so often when A, LGBT people who come from supportive families and live in more open-minded communities do not have an identical experience to LGBT people who come from unaccepting families and live in closed-minded communities. And B, when asexual people are reaching out in need, calling suicide lines, clinging to others and asking for help, I think it's safe to assume that whatever's being done to them, it hurts. I don't know why it has to have been done with the same weapon, for the same reason, to the same extent, before the wounded person is acknowledged and supported. A trans person who is usually mistaken for cis does not stop suffering because of transphobia, even though a trans person who is usually read as trans is going to be in greater danger for it. But both groups of trans people are understood by this narrative to have a space under the umbrella. A gay person who presents in stereotypically heterosexual ways and lacks traits some people associate with gay people is not being told by this narrative that they do not suffer enough. There are gradations of suffering. And even if you're actually determining who belongs based on whose cuts are deepest, it's indisputable that some LGBT people suffer far more than others, dependent on other factors. Not all LGBT people are ostracized from their friends and family. There is not one queer experience. I think it's important we recognize that intersectionality here, as well as acknowledge that some asexual people live in horribly prejudicial environments, depending on how the compulsorily sexual society affects them. It's not always visible to those outside that experience. You don't have to understand why or how it hurts us. But because the pain is caused by the heteronormative assumption, we usually see that LGBT people make natural allies of asexual people, even when said asexual people aren't also LGBT. Rolling your eyes at their pain and painting the queer experience with a broad butt brush that doesn't include them, but also doesn't include an awful lot of actual LGBT people, serves the community very poorly. What's that you say? Some gay people actually can get married depending on where they live? The above narrative says you're only welcome in queer spaces if you can't marry your partner. One of the many problems with oversimplifying the queer experience. Personally, I've never been in a queer space and felt othered the way I have in primarily heterosexual spaces. I've been welcomed and supported and people understood that I was there to give as well as get. We have different stories that led us there, but they had a similar soundtrack. Sometimes it feels like coming home, or like family, especially if you don't have a family that gets it. I think we have way more in common than some of these you aren't oppressed narratives seem to think. But more than that, I think it's dangerous to build an identity primarily around whether heterosexual people hate you and hurt you enough. The reason behind a person's showing up in such a space does often include some pain, but it's not all about what we're struggling with or what we've overcome. It's okay if we're not all the same. LGBT minus asexual people certainly aren't. We're not out to build a hierarchy of whose problems are worse. And if I'm being honest, I don't care if someone isn't able to see my problems on their own. What I do care about is if I tell them and they respond by refusing to listen and then concluding, I have no such story. So that's where I'll end that one. I'm interested in hearing from people who have some thoughts on inclusion in queer spaces and how that's gotten better over the years if it has, uh, what your reasons are if you choose to or choose not to engage with those communities and what kind of experiences you either expect or have actually had um, with regard to queer spaces. Uh, personally, like I said in the narrative I was reading, the times that I've been invited to 
to broader queer events and into queer spaces, it's always been such an in-group feeling, like, that I had more in common with these people than, you know, having a general conversation about romantic issues or sex issues with people that are all going to basically kind of leave me out or treat me like I'm weird because my experience isn't the norm. Whereas it's actually really rare that I've ever been in a queer space and had anybody act like I was the weirdo. So yeah, I'm interested in hearing what everybody else has to say on that topic. And with that, uh, I will say bye-bye for now and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.